think so. All right. Let's go back one. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Cantwell, but I go by Freddie. I'm the Utah Regional Quarter Regional Coordinator here for She Jumps. And thanks for joining us for the winter winter travel prep um, series. Um, yeah, we are here today with a few volunteers from She Jumps, as well as the Utah Avalanche Center and Lone Pine Gear Exchange, as well as the um, snowshoe rep from MSR helping us out with some snowshoeing. Um, their names are Nikki and Hannah from the Utah Avalanche Center. We've got Katie, the CEO and co-founder of Lone Pine Gear Exchange, Leanne and Angela from She Jumps, and then Sarah, who is the snowshoe rep, helping us out there. So. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you guys have any questions while we're going through this, there's a Q&A section um, on the screen. So please use that and we will get to those questions at the end. I saw a few questions about any, um, about being muted. Everyone should be muted except for the presenters. So don't worry about that. All right, I think everyone is here because we all like to play outside and at She Jumps we believe in the transformative play of the outdoors. Our goal at She Jumps is to increase the outdoor activity of women and girls throughout the country and we do that through um, free and low cost outdoor education. And we are a nonprofit and so we really appreciate you guys joining us today with this free event and always appreciate any donations you can give to help us Put on events like these. So we are here for winter. Winter is personally my favorite. I love winter and we hope that you can we can get you guys outside um, in all seasons but especially in winter. Um, conditions can change very quickly during the season and we want to help you get out there as safely as possible. Again, safety. So we're here to help you guys stay safe, recreating in the outdoors and connecting with nature um, in all conditions. And so next up, we're going to have the Utah Avalanche Center um, present their forecasting. And Hannah's going to talk about the next events we have coming up first. So I'll let Hannah take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Freddie. Um, I am just thrilled to be here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hopefully um, there's, there's, a, there's a number of us based here in Salt Lake City. Um, so we were promoting this event around Utah, but we have, uh, we have some presenters from the Northwest, from Colorado, we're spread around and, and I imagine that some of our participants are as well. So welcome, we're glad to have you, whether you're in the Utah area with some of us or elsewhere. Um, this information is pertinent for wherever you may be. Um, but what I have to share about is events specifically here in Utah. Um, so if these aren't in your backyard, um, you can definitely find out about other great events through She Jumps. So to start out, uh, this event is actually kind of our kickoff to our women's programming for the season. And we have, we being the Utah Avalanche Center has worked with She Jumps for about 10 years. And I actually started um, on the She Jump side of things about 10 years ago as a volunteer helping to start our women's collaborative programs, um, which started with a, a, a chat, a presentation at REI and then Beacon Clinics and has grown significantly since then. So this year, gosh, I think we ended up having over maybe close to 10 events, eight to 10 events. Um, some of those are actually already full. So I'm gonna mention the ones that we have that are still open. Um, so you can uh, jump on to joining those ones as well if it works for you. We have actually, and this is one that She Jumps is hosting that uh, Nikki is participating in, but it is on December 3rd, it's Calling Women In, and it is gonna be another online event. Um, you can find all of that information on the um, She Dumps uh, Facebook page, and we'll be sending these links also in follow-up information with the recordings, so you'll get these links. So that's on the evening of December 3rd. Uh, during the day on December 3rd, we actually have a women's rescue clinic that's going to be up in Park City at Woodward. And so this event 
is going to be on snow. Um, crossing our fingers that we have a little bit more snow than we have right now, but uh, there has snow has fallen here, and uh, and Woodward is making snow as well. So you don't need all the best powder out there to practice your rescue skills. So it's very similar to what we've done in the past for the Beacon clinics where you get actually some on snow time, uh, whether you're new to the backcountry or are a seasoned pro, this is, this is a great chance to kind of practice some of those skills, refresh those skills. Uh, so this event this year, um, the, the normal cost of this event is $75. There are, I think, just nine spots still open, and um, we actually have uh, discount codes to um, for she jumps. So uh, you all right now are getting the uh, the access to those nine remaining spots. It hasn't even been published publicly yet. So um, that code, gosh, I don't even know. Can I just share it in the Q and A? Is that possible? Um, maybe I can't answer it but the code is des 3 she jumps so de for december dec3 she jumps and that's the discount code so you're just going to go to um, the link that we'll send you i'll just include it in that follow-up information but um we'll get that out to you and uh and if you'd like to join but 75 dollars is too much for you um we it'll be only ten dollars so that's, it's a, it's a significant discount. We would love to have some of you out there join us for that on snow event. Um, so that would be fantastic on December 3rd. Let's see, next we have December 7th, our avalanche awareness presentation. That is another virtual event. Um, it's similar to the ones we used to have at REI in person. And um, that's just a, a great, again, great for all levels, uh, women, um, any, anyone, Anyone who's interested in uh, learning more about avalanches, avalanche terrain, and coming at it from a perspective of, of being a female um, or female identifying person in the outdoors and, and giving you the, the background that you need to, uh, to, to, get to get more educated and be aware about avalanches. So that's a great virtual presentation on December, the evening of December 7th. And jumping forward, we have a, um, a Backcountry 101 course. So this is a step up from some of those other ones we've talked about where you actually get time on snow. You'll get, uh, you'll get a virtual, um, you'll, get, you'll get classroom um, programming to accomplish on your own time. And then there'll be a couple of hour virtual session one evening that will be on December 28th. That's a webinar. And then December 30th will be the field day. And that will be in um, Big Cottonwood Canyon here outside the Salt Lake Valley. And so, yeah, that event is December 28th and 30th. And then if we have any women who are a little bit farther outside the, U the Salt Lake City area, there is another Backcountry 101 at Powder Mountain. That is January 28th and 29th. So the 28th will be that evening session and the 29th will be your on snow day. Um, and yeah, so we will send all of these links out to you after the event. I think that'll be coming out tomorrow. Um, so most of these events are, a number of them are free, some affordable. Uh, the Backcountry 101s are $190. And uh, that class is specifically made to be short and or to be, um, a little bit more easy to access for newer backcountry users. It's not as intensive or as expensive as an Avalanche One course. However, if you're interested in getting more involved in backcountry skiing, we always encourage continuing to further your education. Um, so I've gone on longer than I probably should have, and I'm going to pass it along to my coworker, Nikki, to talk about weather and avalanches. Thanks, Hannah. So I'm Nikki. I'm a forecaster here in Salt Lake and for the Provo and Ogden area mountains at the Utah Avalanche Center. So we're going to talk about the weather, uh, avalanches, and the forecast. But the first building block of that is the weather. And we're going to talk about some of the resources you can use to get that weather information. So the first, no matter where you are, is just the National Weather Service. That's weather.gov. For the Salt Lake area, um, you can go to weather.gov slash SLC. From there, there's a ton of great resources. The first and one of the most basic would just be the seven day forecast. You'll find a little map. You can select where you wanna be in Utah. 
And from there, you'll get a written out de detailed forecast. It's going to tell you about what the sky is going to do, what the temperatures are going to do, and what the winds are going to do. And if there's any precip, they're going to uh, estimate the totals for you. The nice thing about these seven day forecasts is that there is going to be a little map that you can continue to select locations. So you can compare both what it's going to do in the valley to what it's going to do, say, at the top of Collins or over in Park City. Um, another really nice resource we have here in Salt Lake is the mountain weather or the snow forecast. I included the link uh, right there on the page. It's a resource that the meteorologists over at the National Weather Service put together two times a day, every 12 hours. And the information that's gonna be included in there is just gonna be a basic breakdown of the weather, like a synopsis. It'll talk about what type of systems are building over the area and what to expect over the next couple of days. But then it'll break down the next 12 hours with what the temperatures are gonna be, what the snow totals are gonna be, and what the winds are gonna be at 9,000 feet and 11,000 feet ridgelines. So it's a really nice resource to check every morning and every evening. It's primarily based uh, for Alta, Alta Garden, Alta Collins, and they also put together one for the Provo area mountains. Um, once you pull up some of these weather resources from there, no matter which one you're looking at, so the three things that are really important to look at before you go into the backcountry are the winds, the precipitation totals, and the temperatures, um, and seeing how those are gonna change throughout the day, because um, that will lead into some of the other topics we're gonna talk about later, like layering and what gear you should bring. Once you've looked at the weather or looked at these resources, it's really important to be prepared for changes in the weather. So look at not only the weather that is happening right outside your door when you head out to the trailhead, but what's gonna change in the weather or what the forecast is for the rest of the day. This morning, uh, we woke up and the temperatures were supposed to rise till about 9 a.m. and then they dropped closer to zero and we had wind chills below zero. So if you headed to your car around 8 a.m., you might be expecting a little bit warmer temperatures than what the forecast was putting out. And then once you're actually in the field, don't rely completely on what you read in the forecast. Pay attention to changing weather conditions. And the Wasatch in particular has a lot of small variations. We're kind of a really complex range and that leads to little kind of micro climates within. So be prepared for what you read in the forecast, but always be over-prepared um, for changing weather and pay attention to what's going on. If all of a sudden precip's coming in or winds are increasing, that might be a good sign to alter your plan. Um, I can go to the next slide. So once you've looked at the weather, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about avalanche conditions. So, or just avalanches in general. So who needs to know about avalanches? Really anybody who travels in the backcountry. So that could be skiers, riders, snowmobilers, hikers, extreme snow angelers, really anybody who's spending any time in snow needs to know about avalanches. And we have a really basic way to break down how to make safe and smart decisions. And we call it know before you go. There's five simple steps. I'll run through them real quick. Uh, we have a lot of resources available online as well. Um, if you go to knowbeforeyougo.org, it'll go more in depth about everything I'm gonna talk about. Cause right now we're doing a really brief one slide overview. And Hannah just talked about all the resources that we have available. If you wanna learn more about avalanches, continue to take a class, continue your education. We do an entire hour lecture about this one slide I'm just gonna talk about. So the first thing's getting the gear, the important essential gear that you need if you're gonna go into avalanche train is a transceiver. It's a little computer that both transmits and receives a signal. It's turned on the entire time in, your back, in the backcountry, not once you get caught in an avalanche, but as soon as you leave the trailhead. Um, for those, you want a modern beacon, one that's got three antennas and one that you know how to use effectively. Um, as well, you're gonna need a probe. A probe is used after you've used the transceiver to find your partner. It allows you to get an accurate strike or like actually hit the person buried under the snow so you know their exact location. And the final essential piece of gear is a shovel. Because um, once you've located and probed your partner, you gotta be able to dig them out. So for those shovels, we wanna make sure that you carry one uh, that's metal, one that collapses. You don't want like a plastic snow shovel from like Home Depot strapped to the outside of your pack. So make sure that you have a metal shovel and that you can fit it inside of your back pack. You don't want it strapped on the outside. There's a couple other pieces of gear that people do use, including an airbag pack. Um, 
What an airbag pack does is it makes you a larger piece of debris. And if an avalanche were to occur, it allows you to float to the top. Um, if you think about a bag of Doritos, which chips always end up on top, it's the huge chips. All the airbags allow you to do is once you pull them, you become the largest Dorito in the bag, you float to the top, ideally don't end up underneath the debris. Once you've got those essential pieces of gear and the recommended pieces of gear, you wanna move on to getting the training. Like I said, we have a ton of resources available. I'd recommend first just kind of dipping your toes in, checking out a full hour long lecture, and then getting on the snow is super valuable. If you're not in Utah, there's a lot of resources available. Um, ARI, American Avalanche Institute, American Avalanche Association, are all three resources that have classes listed locally all over the country. After you've got training, so you know how to use that essential gear that you purchased, you're gonna get the forecast. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more on the next page, so I won't go too deep into that because it's a lot of moving parts. Um, but once you've got the forecast, then you wanna get the picture. What we mean by getting the picture is putting it all together. So when you're actually traveling in the backcountry, how to make good choices. Um, and that means uh, of looking at avalanche terrain, identifying avalanche terrain, and traveling in a way that's um, putting all those pieces together. So staying on ridge lines if you can, staying on lower angle terrain if you can, and then finally getting out of harm's way. And that kind of goes hand in hand with getting the picture. Um, there's simple things like only traveling one on a time at a slope, both going uphill and downhill, not traveling above other parties. This year could be a really busy time in the backcountry for hikers, skiers, snowmobilers, riders, snowshoers, everyone. So just having some courtesy and communicating with all the teams surrounding you. So if you see another party and it looks like they're gonna hike above you, you don't have to be rude, but maybe just communicate with them that you're traveling below them, ask them to maybe stay in the trees until you get in the trees. Same with if you see other parties, maybe this season ask where people are going, try to make a plan with the community. There could be a lot of people back there, so we wanna be courteous. And then you wanna know the avalanche danger before you go. So for the Utah Avalanche Center, you can get all of our information from the utahavalanchecenter.org. Uh, it's located right on the homepage. We update it daily at 7 a.m. Um, as well, we put out a Dawn Patrol hotline at 5 a.m which you can call into and just get the basic information on weather, road closures, and an idea of what the forecast is gonna be if you wanna try to get out before work, if anybody still works anymore. Um, and then at 7 a.m. you can also call in and listen to the full forecast. You can also get an email directly to your email. Um, and we have an app. Our forecast for Utah covers nine zones, Logan, Ogden, the Uintas, Salt Lake Provo, Skyline, Moab, the Abjays, and the entire Southwest. So we have a lot of resources. If you're not located in Utah, if you go to uh, avalanche.org, you'll see a giant map that has all of the forecast regions. So you can uh, get to their home pages as well. And if you're traveling in Canada, you can go to avalanche.ca and you'll also be able to pull up their forecasts. And it follows a very similar layout across the country. And so like I talked about a little bit, how you're gonna to wanna to know how to read the avalanche forecast. Every center's forecast page is a little bit different, but they all follow the same ideas and try to give you the same information. So the first thing that you're gonna see uh, when you pull up almost any forecast is the danger rows. That gives you the, that's the rows that you're looking at to the right. That's gonna give you the avalanche danger rating, which is the low, moderate, considerable, high or extreme. Um, and try to give you an idea of where you're gonna find that uh, in the mountain range by aspect and elevation. So if you look at that danger rose right now, what it's telling you is that there's a moderate danger on all lower elevation aspects, a considerable danger on northwesterly through easterly mid and upper elevation aspects, and a moderate danger on westerly through southeasterly upper and mid elevations. What are avalanche danger ratings? Those are gonna tell you the overall danger and travel advice for the day. And it's gonna tell you the likelihood and size and distribution of avalanches for the day. It's not a linear scale. So the jump from low to moderate is not the same as the jump from considerable to high. Um, the most common place for avalanche accidents to happen is considerable because it's the combination of uncertainty, risk, and people traveling in the backcountry that causes the most accidents. 
in low, there's a less, a lower chance of avalanches to occur. It doesn't mean no avalanche danger. It just means it's less likely. And then once you hit high and extreme, less people are traveling in the backcountry because traveling in avalanche terrain is not advised at those uh, danger ratings. So you just see less people traveling, more people are like staying home and drinking hot chocolate on those days. Once you see that breakdown just by color, you're gonna see a bottom line statement. That's those forecasters trying to put it into two or three sentences to get across the danger for the day. It's just gonna say something like this morning said, the avalanche danger is low and avalanches are unlikely, but the risk for the day is gonna be, and then they'll break it down by weather and where you're gonna find that avalanche danger. They're just gonna to try to make it really simple, put it into three sentences or less. From there, as you continue scrolling down the page, you're gonna kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on. The first thing, kind of like what I said, is the weather and snow, because that's like a building block of the avalanche. So we're gonna talk about the weather for that day, the day before and what's coming in the future. And I'm gonna talk about snow conditions. So here in Utah, our snow conditions are pretty grim. That's what our snow statement says. There's a lot of firm surfaces out there. We're gonna talk about what you're gonna see for the snow and if anything else is kind of going on beneath the snow. After the weather and snow, we're gonna talk about recent avalanches because that's a big red flag on what's happening in the backcountry is if people or ski resorts are actually seeing avalanches occur. And then after the recent avalanches, we're gonna break it down even more into the avalanche problems that you might see. Um, for each avalanche problem, which is persistent weak layer, new snow, wind drifted snow, wet snow, normal caution, or glide avalanches, we're gonna talk about where particularly you could find those avalanches, the likelihood and distribution of those avalanches, and kind of what to expect when you're traveling in the backcountry and travel advice associated with that avalanche problem. So every morning you wanna get on that app, you wanna check the forecast um, throughout the season, whether or not you're going into the backcountry every day. It's a really important building block if you plan on spending any time in avalanche terrain to make it part of your daily habit. Wake up, check your email, check your Instagram, check the forecast, know what's going on, whether or not you are traveling in the backcountry that day. Because if you have a good understanding of what's happening with the snow throughout the season, they'll make the days that you do go into the backcountry a lot more enjoyable. All right, thanks, Nikki. All right, now that we know where to go for the avalanche forecast and some of the, the gear and weather, now we've got to think about um, what we want to do when we're outside. What is our, what's our goal once we get outside? What do I want out of my time outside? And one of these things is your seal level for which activity you want to do. Um, for example, backcountry skiing takes a little bit more skill than just going out and hiking on a trail. Um, but maybe you really like backcountry skiing and you want to learn. So got to get your skill level kind of up to where you feel comfortable going into that kind of terrain and that kind of environment. Also, you got to think about where you want to go. Um, as Nikki said, some of the terrain selections might be a little more conducive to snowshoeing, but other places might be, might still have avalanche danger that you want to go. Um, also, something I think about is how much of a challenge do I want and what kind of a physical shape am I in? Do I want to go out just to, you know, get some exercise or do I want to go out and kind of have some more fun outside? Um, like what is my, my goal once I get out? And also, here in the, the Salt Lake Valley, we have a pretty big elevation change from the valley up to our highest peaks. That's something you've got to consider. Um, if you get outside, you might be at a higher elevation for a longer amount of time. And if you haven't been acclimatized to that, it might um, affect your ability to go as far or as long as you want to. Um, also, can I afford to do this adventure? Do you have the right gear? Do you have um, the right knowledge, but also um, can you afford like time-wise, you have enough time to go out and what, go out to do what you want to do. Is there enough daylight? In winter, the sun sets a lot earlier than I always think it does. So um, sunset is definitely something that I need to consider. Um, now then, um, to help you get out there, we've got a couple of resources. One that I forgot to mention earlier because I got a little nervous, <laughs> but Angela will be telling us a little bit more about the Guy GPS app. 
um, after the slide, but I use this almost every time I go out so I can have a really good um, GPS and topo map just right on my phone, very accurate, um, very helpful. Um, another one that I use, um, it is specific to backcountry skiing. However, um, it has um, shading for all of the steeper, steeper aspects and terrain that are more prone to avalanches shaded on there. So you can look at just that map and see if you're going to be heading into any terrain that might be um, more avalanche prone. And they have an Android and iOS apps where you can also just pull up your current location and see what kind of terrain is around you and where you might want to go. Um, when I go out, I also take the paper map because my phone may or may not survive the tour as my phone's a little bit older and the battery's not as great. So the paper map is very helpful and also have the compass, which we'll talk about as part of the 10 essentials a little bit later. Um, also, if you want to head out and but look at some trip reports before. Um, we've got some backcountry skiing groups here in Utah, as well as the Washington Mountain Wranglers, which is more of like a trail running hiking group, but I've seen quite a bit of trip reports out there, even in the winter. Um, there are a couple others I found that were not listed on this slide for Utah Hikes and Hiking, Hiking Utah, and also some a women hikers group, and as well as some hard copy books that I like to keep on my shelf and just reference every once in a while. Those are always great for um, not really trip reports, but just ideas of places to go. Um, there's also a good um, winter recreation website at, for the Utah Office of Outdoor Recreation has a good, a lot of general information on getting out in the winter. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Angela now to talk more about the Gaia GPS. Hi hey everyone, I'm Angela. I am the She Jumps Marketing and Partnership Manager and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I am taking this time to just share some navigation with Gaia GPS, who is also a presenting partner of this series for us. Um, Gaia GPS is a planning and navigation app to help you stay safer while exploring the backcountry. So having a tool like Gaia allows you to always have a map and pinpoint exactly where you are right on your phone. Um, however, it's like Freddie said, it's always have a map and compass because you never know when your batteries might die, especially in the cold weather in winter. So keeping spare batteries or a battery pack either in your backpack or wrapped up in your warm um, down layers when it's in your backpack is strongly advised. Um, so also, um, if you lose yourself on the trail during inclement weather or if inclement weather rolls in, um, you just want to make sure that you can adjust your plan and get um, back to the trailhead safely. So doing that is, is um, when you're out there and you're tracking your route on Gaia, you can kind of follow your route back because sometimes in the winter, <laughs> the trails are covered in snow. So it may not be a defined path anymore. So you can kind of just follow that. Um, and then also just using it. So you're also recording it when you've been there. So you know where you need to go. It's kind of like a breadcrumb trail. So you just hit the record and it'll track you. Um, you don't need Wi-Fi or cell phone service to use it, depending on what plan you have. You just make sure that you download the map um, before you go offline so you can use it. And um, to find and download a route, and you can also use it for route planning. So you can find and download a route um, using Gaia GPS's database of trails, national parks, and wilderness areas. Um, as long and it's not just an app; you can also use it for planning on GaiaGPS.com. Uh, just because you can have like the larger screen from home to kind of get into like more of the detail than using than just being on your smaller screen. Um, Next slide. Okay. Um, so here's some examples of what different map layers in Gaia look like. So Gaia offers um, many map layers to kind of get to use when you're trip planning. Um, and then, so you can, I like again to use my computer from home to start planning and you can find a map for pretty much anything you want to know about. And some examples on here include 
uh, satellite imagery and topographic. You can get snow depth. Um, Freddie mentioned slope shading air, um, slope shading. Gaia also has that in their premium membership. They're also, they also have um, import um, Utah Avalanche Center and like different centers um, avalanche forecasts with a link to click to their resource pages, uh, which is I think a new layer and they it, um, that layer only works when those centers are actually forecasting. <laughs> so sometimes they show and sometimes they don't. So um, if they don't show up, just go to that um, resource directly. Um, and then, yeah, so there's a lot you can do with the app. Um, be sure, and I just, lastly, just be sure to follow Gaia GPS on social media as they're releasing new maps and providing like tips and resources. Cause I know not, it's, it's kind of a very, it's a really good tool, but you really need to know how to use it and understand the maps and map reading. So using their tutorials just really help understand. And then everybody who is in this call or in this event or signed up for the event will get a three month trial of Gaia GPS through a link we're sending um, in the event recap. And I'll share in the chat after I'm done talking. So you guys can sign up and try it out. Um, she, and then in the new year, she jumps will be offering and partnering with Gaia for specific Gaia trainings. So I know this like all seems like a lot. This is supposed to be high level for planning um, just as a tool that you can use. So until then, just check out their blog and their YouTube channels if you're starting your free trial early. Um, okay, and then next slide. I think I'm done. Thank you. All right. I am the next slide. Hi, friends. Um, my name is Sarah, and I work for MSR Snowshoes, and I'm a longtime fangirl of She Jumps. Favorite She Jumps hat, but I was worried you wouldn't be able to see my face. I'd be in the shade. So um, anyways, love She Jumps. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, like I have snowshoeing basics, and um, hopefully it gets you guys pumped to go outside. So um, why would you go snowshoeing? So um, if you love to hike and you like to play outside, snowshoeing is a great way to access the outdoors in the winter time. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hiking and some other traction devices and stuff on our next slide, um, but we're going to cover snowshoeing first. Um, what's great about snowshoeing is you can go just about anywhere um, with a pair of snowshoes. So um, if you think about it, just where do you like to hike? that's where you can go snowshoeing. So you can either do a um, local designated trail, um, stick on the trail where you normally like to hike and things like that. Um, snowshoeing, you can also go off the trail, um, kind of do some bushwhacking, go through the trees, create your own trail. Um, obviously with all the skills that you have learned about earlier in the presentation and will continue to learn about with all your avalanche safety and help. Um, but it's really a fun way for anybody to get outside um, and recreate in the winter time. So um, snowshoeing is pretty easy if you can walk. Um, or hike, then you can snow. snowshoes, kind of what they are and what they help with. And um, of course, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. And snowshoes. Ta-da! I brought props so you guys can see them, okay? This is what a snowshoe looks like. And everybody in this group, I'm sure, needs a good excuse to have another piece of gear. Um, um, so snowshoes do two things. They help with flotation on the snow and they help with traction. Um, so the flotation part is basically, this is just a big giant piece of footwear to help you float on top of the snow. A bigger platform for you so that you sink just a little bit instead of a lot all the way up to the snow. And so that way it makes it a lot easier to the snow. You will sink down a little bit because um, that's just nature. 
Um, so this chin comes from these fun uh, teeth down here on the bottom foot. Um, very similar if you use crampons for um, any kind of mountaineering or ice climbing or anything like that. Um, so we call this your crampon. It's right under your foot to help you with all that traction. Um, sometimes when you're snowshoeing, it's light, fluffy snow. You just need the snowshoe for floating on top to help you hike through it. Um, but sometimes the snow, especially I'm based in Denver, um, I know a lot of the trails in, uh, near the Salt Lake area get very packed out very quickly if you are going to be um, on a designated trail. And in that case, you really need the traction piece more than anything because when snow starts to get packed down, it gets um, we also have traction here on the sides. So these snowshoes are going to help you from sliding slide to slide and front and back. So just give you really nice grip when you're hiking through the snow. Um, snowshoeing, like I said, really very simple. Uh, you put snowshoes on your feet and you go hike outside. Um, all snowshoes do the same thing. So whether it's an MSR snowshoe um, or it's an Atlas or Tubbs or Red Feather, there's lots of great snowshoes out there. They all do the same two things, flotation and traction. That's what they do. Okay, um, a few more things about um, this snowshoe just to get you a little familiar with them so it doesn't feel so scary. This right here is a binding. Uh, so that's what you're gonna attach um, yourself to your snowshoe. And I'll talk about um, the kind of footwear you might wanna wear in just a sec. This right here is a climbing bar. A lot of snowshoes have these on the back. So that if you're climbing, uh, hiking up something steep, what that does is it's gonna keep your cramp on, remember that helps with traction, engaged in the snow. Um, and then it also keeps you, so you can take smaller steps. That way you don't say, uh, use as much energy on your packs. You can save more energy for going uh, further, going on a longer hike, anything like that. So just to kind of familiarize with a few things um, that you'll find on snowshoes. So this is um, what another kind of snowshoe will look like. Same thing, they're all gonna have a big deck that's gonna help you float and then some kind of binding to attach you to the snowshoe and then your traction um, under there. So MSR snowshoes, um, like I said, that's what I work for. See, very official, um, are based in Seattle, Washington. Um, we actually make, we manufacture all of our snowshoes in Seattle. Um, so it's a really cool um, American made company. And uh, we have snowshoes for men, women. Uh, we have unisex snowshoes, we have kids snowshoes. There's kind of a snowshoe for everybody. But like I said, they all do the same thing. So any snowshoes you can get a hold of are gonna be great. Um, so I wanna show you what it looks like with a boot on a snowshoe. Um, people ask me all the time, do you have to have special footwear to go snowshoeing? Um, the answer is no. The best thing to wear snowshoeing is going to be a boot that keeps you warm and comfortable um, and that supports your foot that you like to hike in. So that can be a lot of different things. You could wear a waterproof trail running shoe. You could wear a Sorel boot. You could wear kind of a plastic mountaineering boot. You could wear a snowboard boot. All those things I've seen people snowshoe in. Um, the best thing to snowshoe in, like I said, is going to be a hiking boot that is going to support your ankles, keep you dry, um, and keep snowshoe in. Um, you could also snowshoe in a little bit softer, but it's a waterproof boot um, that has a little bit of ankle support, nice and comfy. All right, like I mentioned, we make uh, kids snowshoe. So snowshoeing is a your entire family. Um, we've definitely been out snowshoeing with three generations, which is pretty fun. Um, so you've got your binding, that's what you can put your, your footwear into. Just slide it right on in there. And if you have kids or younger brothers and sisters or anything like that, um, maybe a neighbor that wants to get outside and do something different, you can take them yourself. Um, some other things that are really just nice to have when you're snowshoeing, you need your snowshoes, you need a good pair of footwear. Um, so 
this is what a gator looks like. And it basically just goes, your foot goes right here, and then it just covers your ankles. It keeps snow from getting in your boots. So um, gator comfy pants, it just keeps the snow out. Um, you could wear um, rain pants. Um, so you don't need a, I would recommend more layers than anything um, because you can always stay in layers. Um, and like I said, gators are really nice because then like I just wear my regular old leggings uh, which are now my work leggings and my dress leggings and my dinner leggings. Um, I wear those snowshoeing and then I just put a pair of gaiters over um, and I'm out the door. Pretty simple. Uh, one other piece of gear that's really nice to have in your snowshoe is going to be a pole. So these are my poles. Um, and what's really nice about winter poles, I'm going to show you the whole thing, um, is they have a nice big basket on the bottom. That way, um, your pole doesn't poke all the way through the snow um, and it kind of helps rest on top. You can use your ski poles if you want to. Um, you can use uh, the same poles you hike with in the summertime. So it's nice about snowshoeing. It's very flexible on the kind of gear you can use. But I do like having a pole. It just helps keep you a little bit more stable when you're um, out there trekking around. Um, so that's really nice to have. So we kind of covered uh, some of the gear. Again, with the clothing, I would really make sure that you just um, wear some layers, wear lots of thinner layers because it's a great workout. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the few other things. Um, great exercise, of course, all ages and abilities. Um, I go with my mom and she's 70 and I go with my kids and they're two and five now um, and they like to go snowshoeing. Uh, my two-year-old usually ends up in my backpack. So you can also do that if you have kids or um, siblings or anybody you're taking with you as put them in a kid carrier. It's a great way for the whole family to get outside and exercise. themselves. Basically with snowshoes, what you're paying for are finding and more. Oh. Oh. All right. Am I unmuted again? <laughs> Maybe. Can anybody hear me okay? Yeah, Sarah, we're, you're, um, you're, you've been broken a little bit, um, actually uh, off and on a bit. So we might, depending on how it goes, we might jump in and have Jen take over um, hiking. I think the mute went through. I was trying to, and it didn't seem to be working. So I don't know if maybe I didn't do something right, but I think I'll, sorry, Sarah, I'm probably gonna jump in just cause we're losing you a little bit. Oh, that's okay. Oh, Bye. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will jump in. Um, like Sarah said, snowshoeing is accessible to everyone. It looks like there are plenty of gear options out there. Um, I know you can go rent some snowshoes for, I believe, around 10 bucks um, at a number of places around. So getting into snowshoeing is also really much easier on the wall than a lot of other um, winter sports. Um, another, another winter activity that has a pretty low entry entry fee, so to speak, is just hiking in the winter. Um, a lot of times you can just get out and go on the trails. Um, with this, it's a little bit easier if it's a little packed down more. Instead of on the snowshoes, you can kind of go wherever you want since you'll be able to stay on the snow with the snowshoes. Um, there are just a couple things that kind of anywhere you go that you want to consider before you go is making sure the trail is open or if the road's open. For example, the Mill Creek Canyon has a winter gate that closes um, I believe November 1st. So if you wanted to go hike up there, you might have to hike a little bit longer to get to the trailhead you want if it's past that gate. Um, another thing what I mentioned before is the sun. It is much colder when the sun is down or if you are in the shade. Um, so that is definitely something to think about. Also, bring in a buddy. Always good to go with other people and um, 
I think Sarah was probably going to show you some yak tracks or micro spikes. I think she held some up, but those definitely help on the kind of the hard pack. There she is. <laughs> those that help with the hard pack hiking or even trail running out in the winter on some snow. Um, let's see, next up, we've got a couple of case studies of when things don't quite go how you want them to. Um, I got one of these from the Salt Lake County Search and Rescue, um, just a lost hiker up in Hughes Canyon. He ended up trying to find a drone that he lost and got off the trail and ended up above some cliffs and it, the sun went down and shoes got really wet and cold. So that's a, I guess a cautionary tale to make sure you know when the sun goes down and have the proper footwear. Um, another one is from just the Utah Avalanche Center, some snowshoers um, got caught in an avalanche in Tibble Fork a few years ago. Um, it was just a small slope, so that is um, a good reason to be aware of your surroundings. And if you want to go look up any of these, um, the Salt Lake County Search and Rescue has a Facebook page where they post their call outs and you can read about the rescues they go out and do. And also on the Utah Avalanche Center, they also have all of their accidents that are reported to them. I found this one from 2014 and I believe they have some even back further if you wanted to go down um, go down that, I guess, rabbit hole if you like reading trip reports and accident reports. Um, so lots of different resources where you can get more info about um, rescues in the area. Now to help avoid that a lot, um, one really good lesson is to have a plan and also not just to have one, but to let someone else know your plan that's not going. Um, for example, I always text my husband if he's not coming with me and tell him where I'm going and when I'm supposed to be back so that he knows when to expect me. And if not, I'll usually text my mom and let her know if we're both going out somewhere. And that way she can definitely tell me or call if something goes wrong and I'm not back when I should be. Um, but when you do this, always make sure you text them or call them when you get back um, so that they are aware that you're safe and that no one else needs to get involved with the search and rescue, especially with these times. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Katie and she's gonna go over some layering, which we've briefly mentioned before. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. Um, I am the one of the co-founders and CEO of Lone Pine Gear Exchange, and I've really enjoyed working with SheJumps and the U Utah Avalanche Center um, with my position here and also um, formerly with Second Tracks. Um, layering. I know we have all heard the Scandinavian saying there is no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. And I would also add to that um, and a lack of layering plan. Um, I can admit that um, in my experience, I'm never the coldest when the weather is the coldest. I'm the coldest when I'm rushing out the door trying to, to get out on the trail or um, in my experience, commute home. I had a, um, an outdoor commute home for a lot of years and um, that's when I got in trouble. So um, I would say make a plan um, because it, in the winter time, layering is so important when you're trying to regulate your body temperature. It's not just about avoiding being cold, it's also avoiding overheating, um, which tends to have some consequences down the line that could make you really cold. So um, I always recommend to start with a base layer um, and select a material and don't forget like your undies and your bras, <laughs> the stuff that touches your skin, you know, the first layer we should call it. Um, you wanna pick a fabric that has really good moisture wicking abilities. So um, synthetic, any type of synthetic blend. Um, I know like the Patagonia Capilene base layers are amazing. Um, these can often leave you feeling the driest. Um, synthetics to be are really durable and um, but merino also tends to, or some type of wool material tends to have a little bit more odor resistance and have some great um, environmental benefits as well as comfort. Um, so establish your material and then look for your weight. A lot of base layers will come with a lighter weight 
um, or, a, you know, midweight or a heavy weight. So if you're one of those people that always runs cold, think about kind of selecting a heavier weight material. And then, um, so that's kind of your base layer, move to your middle layer, and that's really um, important for insulation. So either a synthetic um, heavy duty insulating um, layer, um, one of the nano puffs are always great. Um, down is usually measured in its fill power and down can compress really well, but if you're out and about in the winter and you suspect that you might get wet, um, you do want to add in a wind resistant and water resistant shell. Um, and then throughout your activity, gauge your temperature and, and take off what you need to so you're not sweating too much. Um, put on what you need to to stay comfy. Um, layering, so when we talk about material, it's really important to highlight you always want to avoid cotton in the winter time. It has a tendency to absorb moisture and keep it really close to your skin. So kind of the opposite of the moisture wicking. It also doesn't really offer any insulation when it's wet. Um, you wanna keep your skin covered. So we re recommend um, wearing even like a thin glove liner so that when you take your mittens off and you need to grab your phone or any of your gear, your, your hands aren't exposed. Keeping your neck covered with buffs is always um, important too. And um, we talk about um, avoiding tight clothing. So when you're looking at your insulation, like your down coats, they need to, they need room to, and to stay puffy <laughs> to, to keep you insulated. So make sure you're not smashing down any down layers that you have. Um, we recommend avoiding layering up socks too. Um, for, for comfort to, to reduce any type of friction, um, blisters, any type of that stuff, but also because you, your foot, your feet do need a little bit of room to, to breathe in your, in your boots or your, your snowshoes or your ski boots. So uh, an option is to add heat. Um, I always stash a few hand warmers in my backpacks, backpack or pockets just for those um, just in case moments. There's some really cool environmentally um, biodegradable hand warmers um, on the market these days. It's a good idea to look for. You can invest in merino wool insoles for your shoes. I know that um, there's a couple companies that make really good drop-in um, insoles that keep your feet warmer for those prolonged activities. Um, they also have some heated products like heated socks. Um, heated boots. So if, if your folks struggling with some circulation or um, don't like being cold, that's always an option too. Um, bring a hat. Uh, I usually travel with both a winter hat and a baseball hat to keep the sun off of my face. And um, also be sure to pack some sunglasses and or goggles. Goggles tend to be a little bit harder to um, manage if your activity is um, more rigorous. So you can wear um, sunglasses, but they goggles do tend to be warmer. Don't forget the sunscreen at higher elevations. Your skin's definitely exposed to more intense UV rays. And then the snow and ice can also reflect the UV rays to make them even more intense. So um, pack your sunscreen. I always bring a little bit of salve too for, um, for the wind, for my, my cheeks and my lips too. And then um, don't forget the 10 essentials as well, which I believe um, we're gonna go over in a little bit. Leanne's gonna go over in a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Freddie. Right on. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Leanne, she jumps volunteer. Um, we still talk about the 10 essentials and then we'll go back one slide and talk about where to get some of this gear. Um, so, we touched on navigation earlier. Um, I always recommend having several forms of navigation. Um, as people have mentioned, your cell phone can die, battery can die, especially when it's cold or if you drop it in the snow and it gets wet. So having a backup, um, like a paper map and a compass is a really good idea, especially in the winter. Um, headlamp is a super good idea. As Freddie mentioned, it gets dark a lot earlier in the winter. Um, I also really recommend extra batteries and keeping those batteries inside your backpack or on a layer next to you so that they stay warm. If you find that your headlamp 
if it seems like the batteries are dying, it might just be cold. So sometimes you can stick it in a pocket for a little bit and warm it up and then it should work again. Um, but again, have extra batteries. Uh, sunscreen, sun protection is huge. Um, if you're on snow, even if it seems like it's really cloudy, the sun is reflecting off the snow back at you. Um, so it's really important to wear sunglasses, a hat, sunscreen. Um, I always recommend, remember to put sunscreen like under your chin and under your nose because that sun is being reflected back up at you. Um, definitely sunburn under my nose more than a few times. So even if it seems really cloudy, put some sunscreen on. It, it's kind of just reflecting all around you. So you would be surprised how sunburn you can get on a cloudy day. Um, first aid, super important. It's always good to make sure one person in the group has a first aid kit, um, you know, foot care in the winter. This can be extra pairs of socks, ways to dry your feet off, blister kits, um, you know, insect repellent. And with the winter, I always like to throw in some extra hand warmers because you never know who might get a little bit cold, um, things like that. Space blanket is really important in the winter um, to kind of help if you need to like sit down for a little bit, kind of keep you off the snow. I always really recommend like a little one person bivy sack as well. If you can fit that, that's another good option. If you happen to get stuck somewhere, um, that can really help keep you warm. Um, yeah, and then, you know, knife and a repair kit's a really good idea. Um, you know, knife, duct tape, string, you can do a lot with that combination, whether it's, you know, if your snowshoe breaks or, um, you know, your trekking pole snaps, you've got lots of options with a little repair kit like that. Um, fire, ways to make fire is a really good idea in the winter. Again, if something bad happens or someone gets really cold, having a way to make fire can be really useful. Um, and that can be, you know, matches, a lighter, tinder, you know, something like dryer lint with Vaseline in it's really good. Um, or sometimes even bringing a stove um, is a great option because then you can melt some water, you can make some hot cocoa, um, and that really helps warm someone up quickly. And then shelter, I kind of touched on earlier, um, whether it's a space blanket or an emergency bivy, um, I always have one of those with me, even in the summer. Um, it's amazing how much warmer you can get if you wrap a space blanket around you. Um, it just sort of traps the heat in there. And they make, they make little one person bivvies that are like smaller than a soda can, um, go like all the way around your body. And those can be extremely useful um, in emergency situations. Always bring extra food. Um, if you feel like you're getting cold, a really quick way to kind of warm up is to eat something. Um, and it can be hard to remember to eat when you're cold or you're hiking, um, you know, skiing in the winter. So try to bring more food than you think you need and like remind yourself and your friends to keep eating. Um, same thing, extra water. I have several different water containers. You never know if one's gonna freeze, um, you know, so sometimes it's good to have a few different containers with you. Again, bring more than you think you need. Um, or if you have a stove with you, you know, it's good to bring um, that because then you can always make more water if you need. And then um, as Katie touched on extra clothes, um, it's always good to have extra layers in case one of your layers gets wet. Um, switching to a dry layer is a great way to warm up. Or if you have a friend that's getting cold, um, you know, just always have a few extra layers on you. They can be really, again, really helpful in a dangerous situation. Um, so we go back one slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about where to get the gear. Um, so we've talked kind of about a lot of different pieces of gear um, and it can be a little intimidating to try and go buy all this new. So some really good options for used gear, eBay, OfferUp, Craigslist, KSL, Facebook Marketplace, um, you know, or ask around to your friends that might have some of this gear. Borrowing is a really good option if you just want to like try it out. Um, there's also some amazing consignment shops in Salt Lake. Lone Pine being one of them. Um, they also do gear rentals. So um, I think Freddie mentioned earlier, as low as $10 to rent some snowshoes. Um, renting is a great way to just try something out to see if you like it. And if you do, you can always go scour the consignment shops for used gear. Other spots that you can do rentals are REI and 
all of our local colleges have outdoor programs and they rent to the general public. Um, so they're a really good resource as well. And they generally have a huge array of gear that you can rent from stoves to sleeping bags to tents, snowshoes, striking poles, kind of anything that you could think you needed, they should have. Um, and then there's a few different used gear, Facebook groups as well. Um, Outdoor Gear Utah is one of the bigger ones. If you just search like outdoor gear um, on Facebook, you should be able to find some local groups. Um, so that's where you get some of the gear. I'm gonna pass it off to Katie so she can talk a little bit about hydration and food. Yes, thank you. Did I get unmuted? Oh, perfect. Um, so when it's chilly out, it's always harder to drink enough water. And I would go back and encourage you guys to make a plan. Think about um, what type of activity you are doing and what your hydration needs are and set a goal for yourself. I have, I struggle to drink water when, when it's cold outside. So I usually tell myself, okay, by the end of this activity, I am going to drink X amount of ounces while I'm on the trail. Um, and check in with yourself halfway through, and make sure you're on track. Uh, we always recommend bringing reusing uh, re reusable water bottles or filters, depending on your adventure. Um, be mindful of where you pack your water. Uh, you wanna make sure it doesn't freeze. So they have different um, water bottles can have insulation sleeves, or you can make your own at home with some, some fabric or material that you can pack in your backpack. Packing them in the middle where they're so accessible but would stay warm is always a good idea. Um, packing warm drinks, there's nothing that's more cozy on the trail than a hot cup of tea or hot chocolate. Um, sometimes even soups, so you can bring some warm food out there to keep you cozy. So have fun with it. Um, and then when you're done your adventure, it's always fun to have a stove or a little tiny, you know, portable jet boil that you can heat up some water and, and have a treat when you get back to your car. Um, for food. So when it's cold out, we tend to burn more energy recreating um, than when we do activity when it's warmer or milder temperatures. So think about what type of activity you're doing and then kind of plan for your meal around that if you're to determine if you're looking for something that's more nutrient dense or maybe it's just a quick energy boost. I always like to plan what I'm going to eat after the activity as well and think about how long I'm going for. As the gals have mentioned, I always pack extra. So one of our helpful tips is to pack what you love to encourage us to eat enough while we're out there. I will share one of my favorite superfood bar recipes that I've been modifying over the last year or so um, to suit my, my needs, but you're really looking for something pretty hearty, um, anything with high protein, high fat. So nut butters, salami, cheese, olives, avocados are a great trail um, source. Be mindful of packaging because it's really important to pack out whatever we pack in. That's part of the reason I was inspired to start making my own energy, you know, snacks for the trail because it was something that I didn't have to use the single use plastic for. Um, think about the ease of access. So where you're storing your packs and then, oh, sorry, where you're storing your food, how you can access it. Um, how often you can access it without it being a hassle. And um, I always recommend to keep an eye on your friends and yourself. I think one of the biggest indicators of getting really cold, um, uh, sorry, of getting really hungry is being really quiet um, and also cold too. So if you're with friends and you're noticing like, hey, everyone's really quiet, check in, see if you guys need a, little, a quick 10 minute break to, to have a snack and snack often. Um, we talked about bringing a stove or, you know, a thermos of, of warm food for a special treat. And it's always a great way to keep our skills sharp. All right. Um, Leanne, back on for the last little bit of this, we're going to talk about just a few more of the dangers of winter activities. Um, Frostbite and hypothermia being the two other ones besides avalanches. Um, so we're talk about frostbite real quick. Um, first signs of frostbite is that the skin gets really pale, waxy, and it feels cold. If you like pinch it, it, it kind of keeps that shape before deforming. Um, 
So if it feels, that's what it means when we say waxy. Um, you also start to feel tingling, a little bit of pain, kind of that pins and needles sensation, um, or it'll start to go completely numb. Um, and so as it gets colder and we get closer to true frostbite, that skin's gonna start to feel, um, first it feels kind of soft like wax and then it starts to freeze. Um, and so then it's gonna start to feel hard and that's when permanent damage has happened. Um, and after you get home, if you've had frostbite, um, you know, if it's, if it's first degree frostbite, you'll just get some big blisters and those will go away and you'll be fine. If you start to get into more serious frostbite, um, you'll notice skin discoloration, it'll start turning purple. And that's really serious and you need to seek immediate medical attention for that. Um, so those are really important signs to watch out for. As soon as your skin starts going pale um, or you start noticing that you're getting that tingling sensation or it's going numb, you need to address it immediately. Um, the other big thing to watch out for is hypothermia. Um, you know, the first signs are that you're shivering when you're cold. You might notice that your, your hands, your motor function isn't quite as good. You're having trouble like zipping or snapping things or like opening your water bottle. Um, or you might start to get just a little bit confused, you know, maybe a little grumpy. Um, those are signs that you're, you're cold. Um, as this progresses, you're going to go into really intense shivering, the kind that you can't control, uh, as well as, you know, some more serious signs of miscoordination is you can't like close your hands, you can't grab things, um, you start to get really confused. Um, sometimes people get really like stubborn, or argumentative. Um, and then as you roll into the most severe hypothermia, you stop shivering um, and really your mental clarity is absolutely gone. You can't focus, you can't put things together. Um, you know, your pulse might get really, really weak. So, you know, you really want to watch out for those first signs of shivering and clumsiness. Um, this is something that's really serious and you need, you know, pretty much immediate medical attention if you get to the more severe stages. So with, you know, the same thing with frostbite, if you can stop it in the first stages, then, you know, you're doing a lot better. So some ways to help prevent hypothermia and frostbite, you know, stay warm. It seems obvious, but you know, when you're outside having fun, sometimes you don't notice that your toes or your fingers have gone numb. And it is so much harder to get warm after you've gotten cold versus just staying warm. So, you know, dress appropriately, but also like, you know, check in with your friends and yourself, make sure everyone can still feel their fingers and toes. Um, you know, if you start shivering, that's a really good sign that you need to like, you know, stop and put more layers on or eat something um, or do some jumping jacks. You know, another big one is don't tough it out. Um, you know, sometimes, like I said, if you're having fun, you can forget, you don't notice that your toes are numb um, or maybe you're with a group and you don't want to slow everyone down and stop. But, you know, really you want to, you don't want to get to the point where you're trying to like rewarm up numb toes. You want to be keeping them warm. Um, you know, so if you feel yourself getting a little bit cold, you can stick your fingers in your armpits. Um, you know, that's a really good way to warm them up quickly. Um, or sometimes like kind of between your legs. Um, hand and toe warmers are super effective. I really like using toe warmers because they have a sticky layer so you can stick them to the top side of your boot and then they're above your toes. I also like to stick them inside my gloves on the back of my hand or near my wrist. Um, and that's really helpful for keeping your hands warm or you can put them in your pockets, really wherever. Um, I always like to have a big stash of them for winter adventures. And then again, keep an eye on your friends, check in every you know 15 to 30 minutes, see, make sure everyone can feel their fingers and toes. Um, you know, good thing to check faces, make sure people aren't getting, you know, make sure their cheeks aren't getting precipitation on them um, or their noses, you know, eyelashes, things like that. And if you notice some of the preliminary signs, stop and address it immediately. Um, we're gonna talk about a few scenarios where things haven't gone so well. Um, these are all drawn from the Salt Lake County Search and Rescue. They have a Facebook and um, Instagram page. Highly recommend following them. They post every single rescue they do and it's a really good resource to see what mistakes some other people have made. So hopefully you don't make the same ones. Um, so this first one we're gonna talk about really quick um, is up Integration Canyon. 
Essentially, some young adults decided to go hiking at one in the morning in March in the snowstorm. Um, so already, you know, not making super good decisions about, you know, being in the dark, going during a snowstorm. Um, they lost and one of their friends got to the point where he, the, this person, was almost incoherent. They just sat down in the snow and they refused to move. So, you know, we're talking about confusion, you know, they're already, they're not shivering anymore, which is a really bad sign. Um, argumentative, not making good decisions. So part of the group split off to go get help. Um, while they were doing that, they left this person in the snow. This person ended up taking a shoe off and walking around without a shoe in the snow. Um, so, you know, you may think like, oh, if I get cold, like, I'm not gonna take my shoes off, but there are multiple cases where people get so cold that the late stage of hypothermia, you make some really bad decisions. Um, and this is a really classic example. So, and they also were, all of them were wearing really um, had poor choices of clothing, you know, cotton, flannel. Um, one of the people was wearing like vans, which is not appropriate shoes for snow. Um, the next case was a missing teen in Mill Creek. Um, this teen got dropped off by Uber in Mill Creek and had planned to park, hike to Park City, um, but they'd never told anyone where they were going. Um, and so they ended up being out for 30 hours. They spent the night in Mill Creek in the snow. Um, they had a lot of food, but not that many extra layers. They didn't have a shelter. Um, they knew where they were because they had a GPS, but they didn't have any way to um, reach for help because they didn't have service. So, um, you know, they ended up spending the night in the snow and they made it through because they did, they did have, a, they did make a few good decisions. They, you know, put everything they had on. Um, they kept their core warm and they built like a little snow cave. Um, and then in the morning when it was daylight, they went and found some backcountry skiers that were able to call for help. Um, but again, underprepared, um, didn't tell anyone where they were going. They're very lucky that they made it through the night. Um, generally, if you spend the night outside in the winter without the appropriate gear, it can be a super serious situation. Um, they just had some frostbite. They didn't lose any toes or fingers. They got really lucky. Um, another good example is um, one actually that was just back in October. Um, there are a couple campers that went up and it got really cold and they weren't able to cook their dinner. Um, and so, you know, this is a good example of like, make sure you have the right gear, make sure it works even when it gets really cold, um, you know, things start to freeze even in October overnight. And so make sure you're ready and you have the gear that's appropriate, even if you don't think it's gonna snow, be prepared for it being cold. Um, they ended up being all right as well, but they had to go get help because um, one of the members got sick and they weren't able to get warm. Um, so again, highly recommend reading through the search and rescue pages. They just talk through, you know, sort of the mistakes that people made. Um, and it's just a really good resource for, you know, making sure that you don't make the same mistakes. Um, and I also wanted to touch on really quick with the gear. If you have questions about what to get, highly recommend going to like Lone Pine Exchange or REI. The people that work there know everything there is to know about the gear and they can really point you in the right direction of what's gonna be appropriate for the activities that you wanna do. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to Yulia and I think we're gonna open up to questions. Yeah, I think that's actually me and not Yulia, but um, I am trying to bring up the questions on mine. So I don't know if any of the other presenters can see the Q&A. I can and I can take I'm over. Okay, thank you, Angela. You're welcome. Okay, so um, Lila has a question. I'm a hiker, trail runner, snowshoer, developing my snow skills this winter. Beacon Shovel Pro plus training is an expensive setup to get out at all. Is there a way to identify hikes or trails that would be safer to access even without AVI equipment or training? I can answer that. Okay. Um, so I answered it a little bit over in um, the typed out questions, but avalanche terrain is identified as terrain that's steeper than 30 degrees. Uh, terrain that's less steep than 30 degrees 
avalanches are very unlikely to occur, at least here in Utah. There's a couple instances kind of in the Pacific Northwest with wet snow that you want to travel on terrain less, still even less than 30 degrees. But ideally to avoid avalanche terrain, you want to avoid slopes that are less than 30 degrees. Routes that you can look at, um, if you go to utahavalanchecenter.org and you go to, um, we have a resources tab. I put the exact link over in one of the answered questions, but uh, one of our forecasters has put together uh, recommended routes, um, Drew, and they're identified by like yellow, green, red, orange, um, and the yellow and the green terrain are routes that primarily avoid avalanche terrain altogether. So if you go to that link, it'll give you a couple uh, Utah specific routes that primarily avoid avalanche terrain. Um, if you're somewhere outside of Utah, using some of the resources like Gaia to get a slope overlay onto your map um, and looking at terrain that's not steeper than 30 degrees and then choosing a route that avoids that terrain will be your best option. Thank you. Um, so since the presentation is targeted for those who are new to the backcountry, I think it would be very important to point out that you can't go on hiking trails to snowshoe um, or winter hike without taking into consideration avalanche concerns. I think that's more of a statement than a question. So thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, so Betsy asked, there is so much in addition to Beacon Shovel Pro, what are essentials you carry if you're just going to Alta or <laughs> Poder? I'm not a loker. Is it Poder Park? <laughs> Did I, I say that it's right? Powder Park. It's Powder a Park. yeah. It's a, a touring right near. Alta. Okay, so yeah, we're yeah, close yeah. by. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else want to take that? Um, I can grab that since I talked about kind of the essentials. Um, if you just like Google 10 essentials, there's tons of resources for kind of the basics that you should always have in your backpack. And we kind of touched on some of the ones that are more winter specific. Um, so, you know, again, food, water, first aid kit, sun protection layers. Um, there's a couple others on there, but that's sort of the basics um, and kind of tailor it towards the activity you're doing, you know, if you're going to be out for a while bring warm food that's in insulated container or, you know, hot tea, things like that. Um, you know, warm hat, goggles, those sort of things. Does that sort of answer what? Can I have something to that too, Leanne? Yeah. Um, so at saw we had a presentation, our presentation by Wasatch Backcountry Rescue. And I think on top of those essentials, um, also having a way to kind of get yourself out of trouble for whatever type of recreation you're going to do. So a simple repair kit, that you could either fix your snowshoes, fix your trekking pole, or fix your ski bindings. That could be just a vole strap, some bailing wire, and some duct tape, um, as well as having a way um, to like start a fire and deal with those emergencies that Leanne talked about. So, yep. Okay, I'm gonna jump around a little bit here. And Chelsea asked, wait, so you can't snowshoe on hiking trails. Um, we're not saying that you can't, I'll just answer this. <laughs> Briefly, um, you can snowshoe on hiking trails. However, it may be harder to identify that hiking trails exist when the terrain is completely level with snow, with a snow layer. So we're saying that you can't necessarily rely on knowing exactly where a hiking trail is unless you're using like navigation and just, just being aware that um, other people's tracks as well could lead you astray. So knowing where you're going is, like you're going to be your best resource. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? Okay. Um, so we have some other questions on um, kind of on food. <laughs> so any recipes or places to get recipes for dehydrating on your own? And then someone also wants to know the power bar recipe, if you can share a link. <laughs> Yeah, um, I it's a recipe I've kind of made up um, with hemp seeds and flaxseed and oats and of course chocolate. Everything I take with me on the trail usually is chocolate. Um, I have shared it with Freddie and I'll definitely send out um, the link, but um, I'm gonna encourage you guys like 
don't be afraid to modify it to your taste too. Um, you know, there's a lot of dried fruit, there's different types of fruit and nuts you can put in there. So um, explore away in the kitchen. Cooking is, is its own adventure for sure. Um, and I, was there another question about um, a nutrient or I think I, I've been trying to answer them um, as I see them come through to um, about a skin up, um, the skin up snacks. I usually try to have something like maple syrup or honey. I know there's um, really quick energy like hits like the, the goo packets as well, but I, I feel like the maple syrup tends to be less sticky. So if you're breathing hard, it's always a nice, um, nice alternative. And then um, something higher nutrient or more nutrient dense at the, the top. It's usually what, what I try to plan for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is, what's the feeling on carrying a satellite phone? You can jump in on that if you want. Or Katie, did you want to? You look like you're ready to. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, I have in really remote, um, I think, or you, Liam, why don't you take this? You can take this. One. Okay. Um, I have an in-reach device, which is a satellite communicator. I tend to bring it on almost all of my adventures, even here in the Wasatch, um, just because you never know when your phone might get wet or the battery might die. Um, there are certain pockets where you don't get service. So if you can afford a satellite device, it's just another layer of safety where you can communicate. There's maps on it, you can navigate. Um, you know, it's just sort of a really good backup device to have when things really don't go well. Um, and you can call for SOS usually on them as well. So it's one of those pieces that if you can afford, highly recommend. And the battery life on those are way better. I don't know if you said that or not. I was skimming through other <laughs> questions. So, okay. And then I think we're almost at time, right? So I'm going to, there's one more question. Is there a way to see the degree of trails on Gaia app? I'm also curious how to know how steep the angle of trails and whether I need to worry about avalanche danger for hiking and snowshoeing. Um, so I'll answer the first part of it for the Gaia app. There's this, there's a slope shading air um, layer that you can add that's kind of like a heat map and you can, if you just Google Gaia GPS um, map legends that comes up online, they don't have like the legends actually in the app because there's just so much space in the app that um, they try to utilize it for showing the maps. But if you look at that, that'll show you um, it shows like shadings for a different that you can overlay on your taco map to kind of see how steep different things are. Um, again, it's not perfect and but and it's a map overlay, but it's gonna be like one of the closer things that you can get. I do know that um, in avalanche classes and courses, they do talk about like how to tell the slope um, angle yourself or how to measure it yourself, which is kind of more advanced then we're kind of covering in this um, course and highly recommend like um, follow up with any of the avalanche awareness courses that Utah Avalanche Center provides and ask your questions there. <laughs> um, and then the, the steep angle of trails and whether to worry about avalanche danger for hiking and snowshoeing. Uh, it's kind of a complex question because there's definitely different avalanche traps and shoots like being able to identify um, like gullies and stuff that you might cross on a hiking trail that may not have a lot of snow. Um, I can't really speak for Utah because I live in Washington, but I do know that um, people do use like regular hiking trails in the winter and there's definitely um, two or three that um, trigger avalanches by just hikers or snowshoers every year um, that have fatalities. So just being aware that if the hiking trail or your route does cross it, like gullies or like things that have been triggered in the past is just good knowledge to take with you. I think Nikki could probably add a little bit more onto that if she wants. Um, I think everything she said sounds great. And I can just cover on the one other question that's um, 
is asked and it says one thing that they've read recently is that it's not only the slope that you're on but you want to make sure that the terrain you're traveling up below or connected to so that's kind of when the hiking gets a little bit more complex so if the trail you're on is not avalanche terrain um, which means it's less than 30 degrees you still want to make sure that there's no avalanche um, terrain above you or connected to you. So that means if you're traveling in a valley and it's extreme avalanche danger, you might be traveling on a flat uh, snowshoe trail or trail that's not avalanche terrain, but you wanna make sure that there's no big run out zones or avalanche terrain above you. And that just comes down to getting an overlay, understanding the terrain um, that's surrounding you, as well as when you're in the actual backcountry, starting to take those slope angles even when you're just walking around so you can better identify it without a sloping kilometer um, and just starting to get an idea of what 30 degrees looks like. And, and continuing your education, you'll get more information on how to, you know, what to look for. So if you were to take like an Avalanche 101 class with us in the field day, um, we'll talk about, you know, um, some more of those details about how to identify the, the dangers around you. And then, um, so we are, I'm going to cut off questions after this very last one since we are at time, but does anyone have any thoughts or feelings on the quality of information on trails for snowshoeing? Oh, it looks like maybe she asked about all trails. The app, oh, is that what she means? did I read that wrong? Yes. <laughs> on all trails for snowshoeing. Um, and, and I haven't used it. I don't know if Sarah Kay is still on, um, but uh, she may have jumped off. Yeah. Um, I'm here. I don't know. Yeah. Have you used all trails for snowshoe? Um, I have. And, you know, I live, I mean, I live in Denver, so I don't know if there's any Denver folks on the call, but um, we have a lot of areas that um, I've used the all trails apps for places that I hike a lot in the summertime. And so um, they're very like, well-traveled, well-established uh, trails. And so um, the All Trails app can be a really nice way to find trails that are around you and then consider all the things that everybody else talked about with uh, you know, the avalanche train and stuff like that. Um, but I like the All Trails app. I use it quite a bit. Um, it's fun if you're in a new area or even just, I've lived in Denver for 37 years and sometimes I look on there and realize there's a new place. So the biggest thing with snowshoeing is if it's a trial trail you'd normally hike and has enough snow to snowshoe, then you can go snowshoeing there. Um, assuming all the rest of the things that are from the rest of the experts, the avalanche gals, because that's not my department. Um, but there definitely um, should be lots of places to snowshoe um, close into um, metro areas and stuff like that, depending on how much snow you have. I use it locally and I, I find that it's, it's pretty helpful. Um, I usually kind of scroll through the comments and see if, if anyone's kind of given a, a winter update um, right before I go on a new trail I haven't been on for a while. I also saw in the comments the Trail Run Project or the Trail Forks app. Those are two that I also use to find trails near me and kind of go through the comments to see what the, the recent updates are on the conditions. Well, I think that's we're good on time. So thank you everybody for joining, Jen. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, feel free to email me at freddie at shejumps.org if you have any other questions or if there's something that we didn't send out in the, or I guess don't send out because we haven't yet, the, the post event email. Um, yeah, and feel free to reach out to me on Facebook. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.